Let's begin here in the book of Job by reading the first three verses of chapter 1. What I intend to do uh, today is to take you through the first two chapters. And uh, so I'm going to give to you, as is normal, my uh, prolonged kind of introduction. And it helps you to get a, a picture of what's taking place. It gives you information for those of you who are interested in that, which I think we all ought to be. It gives you background, gives you information, and gives you the kind of information that helps you to understand the purpose of the book and, and things related to it. And so let's begin reading here in the book of Job, chapter 1. We'll begin reading at verse 1. I'll read to verse 3, and we'll get into our study. Job, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 3. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And so we're about to begin a study here in the book of Job, and as we begin I will be giving you an introduction that helps us, as mentioned a moment ago, to better understand this book. And so as we look at this, we begin first by seeing that Job is introduced to us. Notice how Job is introduced. He's introduced as a righteous man, and he's living in the land of us. Now, just where would this land be? Because uh, people will say this land, it's difficult for us geographically to place, it would seem that the location of this, this land called Uz would be east of Israel, and commentators say that it was a, a, a land that would border modern Jordan. In the Old Testament book of Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 21, it says, Rejoice and be glad, O daughter of Edom, who dwells in the land of Uz. But the cup will come around you as well. You will become drunk and make yourself naked. Well, Edom would have been what is modern Jordan. And so because modern Jordan is associated with the land of Uz, it is, it is commonly believed that that's the location there in the Middle East. So Uz would be located on the border of modern Jordan. The Edomites would have been in possession of Uz, and so it is southeast of the nation of Israel. So Job is a man who lived in this land, and this story is about what he went through. In Hebrew, his name means assaulted or persecuted one. That's what Job means, the assaulted or persecuted one. And this is what will give the theme of the book, the assault on Job. The Arabic translation of Job means the repentant one, which reveals his humbling that takes place in this particular story. It's a story about a man who loses everything. He loses his children, he loses his wealth, he loses his health, he loses his reputation. And it's a story that approaches the question, why do the good suffer and the evil prosper? You see, people will say, if God is all loving and God is all powerful, then why do the good hurt? And why do the evil seem to get away with sin? Well, the question of why, why the good suffer is an age old question. You see it even in the, uh, the book of Psalms. The psalmist Asaph wrestled with that question. In, in Psalm 73, verse 3, he said, I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He went on in verses 12 and 13 of Psalm 73 and said, This is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They increase in wealth. Surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. So the question, why do the good suffer and the evil seem to get away with everything, is an ancient question. And so the book is going to answer that question. And the answer to that question is an appeal to what is called the sovereignty of God. You see, suffering is not the central issue of the book of Job. What is learned by suffering is the central issue. Job experientially learns that God is sovereign over everything, that God does even as God wills. 
Like it says in Psalm 115, verse 3, our God is in heaven. He does whatever pleases him. And Paul put it this way in Romans 9, verses 20 and 21. He said, who are you, O man, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to him who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for noble purposes and some for common use? Who are you to answer against God? Who are you to question him is what Paul was saying. It, it is his way of simply saying God is, the, God is God and I'm not. Now, as you look at this, the time of the writing of Job is interesting. The, the events recorded predate the actual writing of the book. It's believed that the events took place, if you were looking at your Bible, they would take place between Genesis chapter 11 and chapter 12. That would be between the building of the Tower of Babel and the call of Abraham. So it was an ancient book. It's recognized as the earliest book of the Bible. And the events occur in what is called the patriarchal period, the time of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. The accurate dating is difficult. There are no references to contemporary historical occurrences, and therefore it's difficult for them to know exactly when it was written. As well as the author, the author is unknown, and he's not identified in the book. So there have been various authors that are suggested. Job himself is one, Solomon, Isaiah, Hezekiah, Ezra. They've all been suggested to have been the ones who were used by the Lord to write this. One commentator said Moses most likely wrote the book because the land of Uz is in ancient Edom, just south of the Dead Sea. It was located next to ancient Midian, and Moses lived in Midian for 40 years. Moses may have obtained a record of this event and under God's direction, included it in his writings, thus he would have written this book between 1485 and 1445 B.C. If you look for key verses... The key verses give us insight into Job and his questions and God's solutions. In Job 131, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a key verse. Job 9 verse 33, if only there were someone to arbitrate between us, to lay his hand upon us both. Job 13 15, another key verse, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And then Job 25, verse 4, How then can a man be righteous before God? How can one born of woman be pure? These are all key questions that are answered in the book of Job. The most beautiful revelation of Job's heart towards the Lord is found in Job 19, 25 through 27, when he said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes, I and not another, how my heart yearns within me. And so these are key verses and key insights. The book begins with a controversy, a controversy between God and Satan. And the controversy covers the first two chapters. From there, a debate between Job and his friends occurs as to why he's suffering. Job initially defends himself, and he basically has three complaints. First, he says, God is punishing me for something I'm not even aware of doing. In chapter 7, verse 20, he says, Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? Secondly, Job contends that God doesn't hear him and has even come against him. In 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 24, he says, Why do you hide your face and regard me as your enemy? Third, God allows the wicked to prosper, but seems to ignore the righteous. In Job 21, 7, why do the wicked live and become old? Yeah, yes, and become mighty in power. And so these are, these, are, these are questions everybody has asked, and we have opportunity to see God's response. You see, through Job's constant self-defense, we're going to see this take place as we read the book. Job becomes guilty of self-righteousness because God ultimately is going to end the debate by pointing this out in chapters 38 through 42. And so we're also going to see the result, which is Job being able to weather his incredible trial and being blessed by God. You know, the story of Job is legendary. It's well known. Job is mentioned elsewhere in Scripture. Ezekiel 14, verse 14 says, 
Even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. James 5.11 says, As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You've heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. You know, what's interesting is Job is mentioned in the Quran and is spoken of as ever returning to God. In what is called Surah 3844, he is seen as pious, not simply repentant. So he's, he's famous not only in the Jewish religion, but even the Quran makes mention of Job. And so there's your basic foundation. Let's begin the book. Job chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. I, I didn't mention this to you, but the word Job also means wizard. So he was the wizard of Uz. Okay, no, that's not true. <laughs> Just seeing if you're listening. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I was reading it today, and I thought I ought to say that, and I did. So it says, there's a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. That man was blameless, upright, feared God, shunned evil. So you see four Four things that are I pointed out, four character traits. One, he's blameless. This is a man who is called blameless. The word blameless is a word that actually can also speak of integrity. It's, it speaks of somebody who does not lack in anything. It's not sinless perfection, by the way, but that he didn't have sins at the time that God was dealing with. And that helps us to see that suffering may occur for reasons unconnected with any sins. Job is not initially being chastised for sins that he's committed. He's not being chastised at all. A second thing we see about him as we are introduced is that he's upright. That word upright speaks of pleasing or righteous. It speaks of being unblameable. It, it's a word that can speak of being straight. He was a man, in other words, who was conscious of living properly, and he did so for God. It's like what it says in Psalm 19, verse 13, Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I shall be innocent from the great transgression. And so he's a man who is upright. He was pleasing to God. He was righteous, unblameable. He was straight. And then third, he feared God. He, he was a man who was devoted to the Lord. He's a man who had a holy life. Proverbs 22, 4 says, By humility and the fear of the Lord, our riches, honor, and life. This is a man who feared the Lord. He was devoted to him. And then a fourth trait is he shunned evil. He hated sin so much he kept habitually turning away from evil. And that's an obvious uh, fruit of fearing God. It says in Proverbs 16, verse 6, By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. In Ephesians 5.11, Paul said, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Rather, reprove them. This is a man who shunned evil. He hated sin. He turned away from it. And so he's initially, immediately given to us as a man who is righteous. He's blameless. He's upright. He fears God. He shuns evil. In verse 2, he had seven sons and three daughters. Seven sons and three daughters. He's a loving father of ten children, and children were a blessing of the Lord. As it says in Psalm 128, verses 1 through 4, Blessed is everyone that fears the Lord, that walks in his ways, for you shall eat the labor of your hands. Happy shall you be, and it shall be well with you. Your wife shall be as a fruitful vine by the sides of your house. The children, like olive plants, round about your table, behold, that thus shall the man be blessed that fears the Lord. This is a man who had 10 children, an indication of being blessed by God. So he had a wife and he had children. And verse 3, also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So he had sheep and camels. That means that he's a merchant. He had an oxen, which speaks of agriculture. He had female donkeys, which at that time spoke of dairy. He had a large household of servants. This made him 
or he's declared to be the wealthiest man in the East. He knew that his wealth was evidence of God's blessings in his life, and he praised God for it. It goes into verse 4 and says, His sons would go and feast at their houses each on his appointed day and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. And so it was, when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would send and sanctify them, and he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. One of the evidences of his devotion is that he had a family, a family that was filled with love for, the, for, for one another. Uh, on their son's birthday, because that's what's speaking, being spoken of here when it speaks of their day, uh, on, the, on the, their birthday, they would have a gathering. They would get together and they would invite their brothers and sisters and they would celebrate with, with, uh, with him. And uh, it would be just a great day. And, and yet, as this is taking place, notice in verse 5 how it says, in case they had forgotten God, Job would arise early and he would make an offering on their behalf. He was concerned that, that, that they might have, 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 have slighted God even in their heart. And that's how righteous it's, he was. They may have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. He's, they, they may have forgotten God in the midst of the celebration. And this is the kind of father he was. He was the kind of dad that he was concerned for their well-being and concerned with the glory of God. And this gives us a snapshot of this righteous man. This is a man who was rich. This is a man who was well-esteemed. This was a man who was a father, had great family, everything. Everything's going well for him. And then verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he'll surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. That's a day... When God orders his angels to present themselves to him. When it speaks concerning this in verse 6, it speaks of the sons of God. The sons of God is another way of speaking of angels. You see the term sons of God used in chapter 38, verse 7, in reference to angels. And the reason they're referred to in this way is because it speaks of the resemblance to God in power, dignity, and in holiness. But notice how it says that God orders his angels to present themselves before him. The word present, for those who take notes, is an interesting word. It speaks of a military presentation. It, 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 is, it is like in, in the military, there were times when we had to present ourselves. When I was in the army, if our company commander called us to an assembly, we had to assemble. Uh, we may be there to present ourselves to him. And it may be that he's going to question us related to some things pertaining to, to what we were supposed to be doing. That's a word that is a military word. It's a, it's, it's a word that speaks of giving account of what they've seen and what they've been doing. And as they're doing that and, and giving an account, they're also receiving directions as well as commands. And as this is taking place, notice Satan also came among them. And so when it speaks concerning Satan in verse 6, Satan also came among them, the word uh, Satan is literally the one who withstands. He's the adversary. He, he's called in Revelation 12, verse 10, the accuser of the brethren, and he's among the angels. And so Satan comes and assembles himself. God allows that to take place, and God is questioning him and begins to. And so in verse 7, the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? 
And so what he's doing there is not having a conversation. He's calling him to accountability. He's saying, I'm asking you, or I'm commanding you to tell me what you've been up to. Give an account of yourself. Now, he's doing that in front of the angels. It's not that God is not aware of what he's doing. It's so that the angels who haven't fallen have an opportunity to hear an account given to, to, to God and, and understand more of how, how Satan is working and all. And so he says to him, give an account of yourself. What have you been up to? From where have you come? That gives to us an insight into God's sovereignty. Satan must give an account to him. They're not equal. There are those today that I've heard, and it's been going on for some time, where they say that there are really basically two gods. There's God, and there's Satan, and they're equal, and they're fighting. The Bible nowhere indicates anything like that. God is God. He's the creator of all things and is sovereign, all-powerful, almighty. And Satan is a created being who has to give an account of himself to God. And that's what God is doing here. Where do you come from? What have you been doing? Well, Satan answers and says, well, when he says, what, what have you been up to? From where have you come? Uh, Satan answers the Lord, and he says, from going to and fro on the earth. He is never resting. He is never ceasing in his search to destroy and to corrupt. I have been in a constant move. I've been going from place to place looking. He never rests. He's always searching for someone to destroy. It's like what it says in 1 Peter 5, verse 8, where Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. And that's what he's saying. I've been going to and fro. I've been going throughout the earth. I've been looking. I've been up to no good. What have you been doing? Well, this is what I've been doing. So he says in verse 8, have you considered my servant Job? When he says, considered, have you set your heart on Job? Undoubtedly, you've seen him. You know how righteous he is. Have you noticed him? Have you seen his righteousness? Have you seen the way that he lives? He is my true servant. He's faithful in all that he does. Have you set your sight on him? He is righteous. He loves me. There's none like him on the earth. You're looking for defects. Have you set your heart on finding any in him? And that's what the Lord is saying. Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Have you set your sight on him to destroy him? Well, Satan answered, verse 9, answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. Can you hear the arrogance? Can you hear that evil? I, I've noticed him. Yes, I have. But you don't let me near him. You're protecting him. You're protecting his family. You're protecting his possessions. The psalmist said in Psalm 34, verse 7, you might want to note this, the angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. You've been protecting him. You've set a hedge about him. Oh, <laughs> you're asking me if I've seen him. Of course I've seen him. Yes, I've been examining him. Yes, I've been wanting him. Yes, I desire to destroy him. Yes, I do that. And listen, you think that he's blameless? You think that he's upright? You think that he fears you? You think that he shuns evil? Well, why wouldn't he do that? You put a hedge about him. You bless him. He has a lot. He has family. He has friends. He has, he has honor amongst people. He has money. He's got everything a person could want. You think that he does that? Do you think that he fears you because he loves you? No. If there's any fear at all in his heart, it's, it's a fear that he's going to lose all the things that he has. You see, he lives on an island of security. The fact is, it pays to fear you. Who wouldn't? Who wouldn't fear you? <laughs> if they're constantly protected and blessed, if you don't allow me to get to them, who wouldn't fear you? He only serves you because it pays off. 
But when you really look at the man, yes, I have considered him. Yes, I have looked at him. Yes, I have scrutinized him. Yes, I have looked for a weakness in him. I have studied him. Many years ago now, it's been many years, 30 30 some years easily. I was talking to a friend of mine, all of us know Raul Reese. And I was, as I was speaking to Raul about something or other, Raul shared something about when he was in the world, and, and perhaps you may not know who Raul was or is actually. Raul, uh, as a younger man, was a very violent man. He was a, a man who, who got in a lot of fights, enjoyed fighting and all of that. That's what he was. He's a martial arts master, an eighth degree black belt in a, a form of Kung Fu called San Su. He's a, he's a ferocious, ferocious fighter. And, um, and so I know him. He used to teach my sons um, Kung Fu uh, years ago now. And so I, I was there and I would go to the classes and all and I would watch my children as, as uh, Raul beat them up and it was very pleasing to me. And as I would be there, we would talk. And, and so one day he was just visiting and he said something I've never forgotten. He gave me some insight and I'll share it with you right now. He said, yeah, that he was, he said, yeah, before, you know, I was a Christian, I was about to get in a fight with somebody. He's just talking to me about that. We're in a martial arts class. He goes, and I studied him, and I was studying him, this is the phrase he used, and I was studying him, and it hit me. That's what fighters do. That's what they call when boxers are watching film or they watch their opponent. They're studying them. That's what they're doing. They're looking for a weakness. They're looking for the way he reacts if you throw a jab or whatever. Everybody who knows anything about boxing and all, it, it's, it's studying your opponent, getting to know them, looking for their weakness. That's what Satan is doing with Job. Have you considered him? Is another way of saying, have you scrutinized him? Have you looked for a defect in him? Have you found a weakness in him? Have you looked closely? I know you have. Give an account of yourself to me and tell me what you're doing. Notice how Satan immediately says, well, of course. But you put a hedge about him. You won't allow me near him. You have kept me from doing what I can do. Why wouldn't he worship you? Why wouldn't he have an outward form of, of, of honoring you and, and a righteousness? You, you've blessed him with so many things because you keep me from, from getting to him. But if you were to remove that hedge, he will curse you to your face. You see, he only serves you because it pays off to do that. But verse 11, stretch out your hand, touch all that he has. He'll surely curse you to your face. And the Lord, verse 12, said to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. So evil is held in check by God, but he allows Satan to work against Job. In verse 13, now, there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys feeding besides them when the Sabaeans raided, raided them and, and took them away. Indeed, They've killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants, consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people. They're all dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. One thing after another, after another, after another. Each disaster building on the previous one. You have these people who are the Sabaeans. They're, they're the people of a place called Sheba. They were Arabians. And they, they, they fell on his servants and destroyed and stole from, from Job. 
Then they speak of the fire of God. The fire of God speaks of lightning. So after that raid, lightning strikes, killing sheep and servants. And then you have the Chaldeans, and they raid, and they steal the camels, and they also kill servants. And that's all bad enough. But finally, your beloved children have all been killed in the home of your eldest son, in the midst of them enjoying life and celebrating. They were all killed. I alone have to come and tell you. One disaster after another. Job arose, verse 20. He tore his robe, shaved his head. He fell to the ground. And he worshiped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave. And the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is a very personal scripture to me. I've mentioned this with you to you before. When my father went home to be with the Lord and I walked into the room, that's the scripture that I, that I quoted. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How do I and how do we respond to successive waves of pain? How? One thing after another, destruction, death, the loss of material wealth, all of those things obviously are terrible. But the concluding disaster, the concluding pain would be almost more than anybody could bear. You know, these babies that you love so much, these 10 children that you have, the ones that you would arise and, and make sacrifice for in the event that they may have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. You know, those kids, the kids that you love from the time they were born, the ones that you held in your hand, the ones that you, you, your hands, the ones that you taught to walk, to talk, to love God and all of those things. You know, those kids. You know the kids that you train to love one another? A family that gathers together, the, the brothers love each other and sisters so much that when it's their birthday, they throw little parties for, for themselves and everything. It's just a great thing. You know that those people? They're all dead. They're all dead. You've lost everything at one time, Job. Everything. You've lost all that you have, all of your possessions, not just the physical ones, but you lost the ones that mattered the most. You lost your children. Everything, the house was destroyed, wind came, and God is being blamed for this, by the way. What are you going to do, Job? And Job simply arises. He, he tears his robe, shaves his head. These are all signs of mourning. It's signs of, of terrible grief. And he, and he says, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return there. The Lord gave. The Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I've, I've had people over the years of my ministry tell me, oh, I feel like Job, and I smile. And there's only one Job. We can go through a problem, that's for sure. Who doesn't? But no, there's only one Job. And by the way, this was a righteous man. And very often the things that we have suffered are, are actually the fruit of our own, uh, our own sinfulness. We, we reap in what we sow sometimes, you know. And, and when we think we're like Job, perhaps we're really not. Maybe we're not doing the things we ought to. And, and, and uh, what we're doing is we're receiving uh, God's correction. So, but in the case of Job, what you have is him tearing his robe and shaving his head. These are signs of terrible grief. And, but at the same time as he's grieving, he's worshiping God. And that's how he responds. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, verse 22, in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. He didn't say that God was unjust. He didn't say that there was some moral impropriety with God and all this. He didn't blame God for what had taken place. So many are so quick to blame the Lord, but he didn't. He just said God gave and God took away. Well, in verse 1 of chapter 2, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? 
And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. The Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him on the earth, blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he'll give for his life. Stretch out your hand now, touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand, but spare his life. Once again, Satan appears before God, and once again, God renews his challenge. You've seen how Job has responded to the things he's gone through. Your intense hatred provoked you to incite me to allow this. And even though I did, Job has remained faithful. And so Satan says, well, yeah, of course, skin for skin, all that a man has, he'll, he'll give for his life. A man will do anything he, he can to survive. But if you touch his health, he will curse you to your face. And though he has no wealth, he's still healthy. And once again, he could gain wealth. And, and he's still young enough to have family. So take that away from him. He will curse you. Now, what's interesting when you look at this, and, and I want to point this out briefly, the two things that people desire to protect are their wealth and their health. Those are the two basic things that people protect. When I was a young man, as I was growing up and about to go into the work, uh, workforce and all, my father was speaking to me, and, and he told me something I've never forgotten. He said, son, take care of your health, because if you take care of your health, you're going to be healthy enough to go to work. So take care of your health so you can go to work. What was my dad teaching me at the age of 17? He was teaching me health and wealth. He was saying, if you take care of your health, you can have wealth. It's a very ancient reality, and you have it here in the book of Job. You have Job who had wealth, and you have Job who had health. The two things that matter to most human beings, their health and their wealth. And what has happened is he has lost both. He lost all of his wealth, including the loving family he had. And you'll notice his beautiful wife in just a moment. We all know her. And then his body has been devastated. You see, Satan still uses these things to entrap people so that they might reject God. Because if you look at what's going on right now in the United States, what is, what, is, what is being used to keep people in fear if it is not their health? What is keeping people in fear right now? The fear of COVID-19. It is something we all instinctually have, a desire to be healthy, to protect our health. And why do we want to protect our health? For obvious reasons, of course, to survive, but also so that we might be able to continue to work to provide for the family. Satan still brings fear and still brings those kinds of things into our life to cause us to focus only on the immediate in order that we might take our sight off of God. And if something happens to us that hurts us or disappoints us, he very often uses these kinds of things for us to curse God to his face, to say, I don't trust you anymore. I don't believe in you anymore. And that's what Satan is doing, verse 6. And when God says to him, he's in your hand, spare his life, because Satan had just said, stretch out your hand, touch his bone and flesh. He'll curse you to your face. So, verse 7, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. He gave to him these pain, this painful disease. The uh, commentators believe it's what is called elephantiasis. They describe elephantiasis as an intense heat, a burning and ulcerous swelling or leprosy in its most terrific form. It, it takes its name from the appearance of the body, which is covered with a knotty, cancerous bark like the hide of an elephant. 
the whole frame is in a state of progressive dissolution, ending slowly but surely in death. So his body is ulcerated, it's swollen, it's producing um, pustules all over, all over. And so he's sitting in an ash heap, and there's uh, in this ash heap, it's like being in the in the in in the um, in the junkyard. It's like being at the dump, and and he finds a broken piece of pottery, and he's sitting there. This man who was the richest man, this man who had everything going for him, and now he's lost everything, and he's 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 there sitting in an ash heap, and and he's got a broken piece of pottery, and he's pressing his skin with it, and as he's pressing it, he's removing the 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 pus that is forming under his skin. It's a horrible picture here, and he's scraping himself as he's sitting there. His children and his servants are gone. There's no one who has helped him, and no one who's coming to his aid. This man has undoubtedly helped others, but they're not coming to his aid. And there he is, he's left with a, a, a broken piece of pottery. He's relieving the pressure of the boils. As this is taking place, and can you imagine, here comes Sweetie Pie, his wife. And verse 9, his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die, sweetheart. Is that not what Satan said Job would do? If you touch him, he will curse you. It is very true that very often the enemy can use those who are closest to us to hurt us the most. That's very true. The ones who could have been there to be of support, the ones who could have been there to be of encouragement, sometimes are the ones who hurt the worst. This man has lost everything. Picture it. This is a man, and he'll speak of this. We'll see this in the book of Job. When he would walk into the room, the elders would stand to give him respect. But he became the song of derision of children. They stopped respecting him. There he is in utter pain and in utter rejection. He's lost everything. And this has been going on for some time, by the way. And his wife finally says, curse God and die. She's echoing what Satan said Job would do if God were to touch his body. The question is asked, are you holding fast to your faith, seeing that it's gotten you nowhere? If you tell God that he hates you and he hates those he should love, he'll put you out of your misery. So just, just say that to him. Just say it. Just say, God, you don't love me. God, you're not fair. God, you're not righteous. God, look what you've done to me. Just say it. Just say it. You could almost hear her broken heart too. Just can't watch you do this anymore. Just can't watch you do this anymore. You're almost dead to me anyway. You might as well just tell God he's unfair and let God kill you. It'll put both of us out of our misery. It'll put you out of yours, and I won't have to see this anymore. Tell him that he hates you. Tell him that he's not worth following. And let him put you out of your misery. And what does Job do? Verse 10, he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I, I don't serve God only in good times. I serve God at all times. I don't serve God only when it, it's, you know, the sun is shining and the birds are singing and everything's going well for me. I serve God whether it seems to be good or whether it seems to be bad because it really doesn't matter because it's the same God that I serve. And the things that are going well for me are things that I can rejoice and say thank you for your blessings. When it's not going so well, I can say thank you for your lessons. Thank you for teaching me the things that I learned in the dark place. Thank you 
for being the voice that speaks to me in my personal times of sorrow and struggle. Thank you, Lord, because when I feel that I'm alone, when I feel that there's nobody who understands, then, Lord, that's what causes me to realize that in my weakness, then I am made strong. Thank you, Lord, for the blessed afflictions that I endure because as I go through these afflictions, my faith is made more pure and I see you more clearly. And why would I say things about God who has been so good to me? Why, when things are not going the way that they that I wanted them to, should I turn from him? Shall I not receive evil from his hand as well as good? God is a fair God and nothing comes into my life that hasn't first gone through his perfect will for me. Have you understood that one yet? It's true. Some of the deepest lessons you will ever learn, some of the deepest lessons I have ever learned, have not come in the times on the mountaintop. They have come in the valley. They've come when I have felt alone. They have come when I have felt abandoned. They have come when I have felt rejected. They have come when I have felt lost. They have come when, when, when everything was in front of me, everything in front of me said, this is going to be a failure. It ain't going to happen. He's not going to come through for you. When they said to us, you need to close churches and you can't meet any longer. And as I shared with with you before, some of you heard me say this. With this COVID-19 and all, and and I'm sitting in my house, my son Joseph is is there with me as the news is is giving us this this, um, announcement that all churches will be closed. And I turn to my son and I look at him. And I said, that's not good news, son. That's not good news. And my son says, dad, it's going to be all right. The Lord is going to see us through. And I said, I'll shut up. (laughs) You speak as a foolish woman. No, I said, I said, I know that. I'm the one who taught my son what faith is. I know that. But that doesn't mean that your heart doesn't get concerned. I said, you don't understand, son. You don't understand. We have 50 staff members that rely on income to pay their bills. We've got a building that we pay for, 13 acres of land that we pay for. We have maintenance costs. We have electricity costs. People are not going to be in church, son. There'll be no funds to pay for everything. I said, I knew that one day I would be leaving ministry. I knew that. I just didn't know it would be this way. And I teared up in front of my son. I just didn't know. It would be this way. And I sat there and I just got up and I went to, to my room to go to sleep. I laid my head on my pillow and I said, Lord, you're in charge. You are in charge. I remember getting up the next day, driving to the office. The Holy Spirit reminded me of something that God taught us when this church was less than a year old when we were looking for a place for us to meet and we couldn't meet, we couldn't find a place to meet. We were being evicted from the place that we were meeting at and we couldn't find a place for the church. And and the Lord spoke to my heart in a way that was audible with an internal voice that said, I did not raise you up to let you fall. I did not raise you up to let you fall. And when he originally had done that 39 years, almost 39 years ago now, I remember nodding my heart and even my head in agreement saying, you know, you've always been faithful and you will remain faithful. You will remain faithful. And I came to the office. And I was given an account of how our finances were. And even though we weren't meeting, people began to give online and began to be even more generous than when they're attending. And not one day in all of these months, not one week, have we not received enough to keep this church 
floating. Not once. God does that. And these are, this, this may seem like a material thing to you, and, and in some ways it is. Uh, Job lost his material wealth. It may seem that it's just a material. It's not, because giving is spiritual. Giving is spiritual. It's a spiritual act of worship. And when people are supporting their ministry, they're actually worshiping their God. And, it, and the Lord said, no. He said, because as I was driving, he spoke to my heart and said, I did not raise you up to let you fall. And the Lord has been good. And you learn these things. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God takes care of us. No, I, I, he is the God of, of when the sun is shining. He is the God when, when it's dark and cloudy. He is the God that we serve. And we know that he takes care of us. We don't serve God only in the good times. We serve God at all times. Even when we're hurting in Habakkuk. Chapter 3, 17 and 18, though the fig tree does not bud, there, there are no grapes on the vines. Though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. My God shall supply. He always has. He will always provide for us because he loves us. And shall I serve him only when it's good, or shall I not serve him always? And it says, in all of this, Job did not sin with his lips. Now, when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had, had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Aliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuite, Zophar, the Namathite. For they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And, and each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. And no one spoke a word to him. They saw that his grief was very great. They traveled from long distances. When we get to chapter 7, you're going to see at verse 3 that, that Job at this time has already been suffering for months. And so they came from different area. The Temanites is uh, in northeast Arabia. It's uh, the land of Eden. Now, the Namathite is an unknown place. Some say that it might have been to the south in Judea. But this fellow here, this other guy is interesting to me. Bildad, he is the shortest man in the Bible. Did you notice that? He's Bildad the shoe height. He's very, very small. I'll let that settle for a moment. We don't know where he's from, possibly ancient Mesopotamia. But here's the last thought. Notice verse 13. They sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights. No one spoke a word to him. They saw that his grief was very great. That's the best thing that could have happened at this time, that they were silent. Silence, and let me give you something very brief. Silence sometimes when somebody is hurting, to silently mourn with them, to weep with those who weep, sometimes is the most important thing you can do. Because... Sometimes we can be very awkward when we try and bring comfort to somebody. A woman loses her, her baby in her womb through a miscarriage, and somebody with a good heart really wants to comfort her and, and says, well, don't worry, you'll get pregnant again. Well, any lady who has gone through a miscarriage, that doesn't comfort them. Your, your father dies, and they say, well, you know what? You'll see him again. He's in heaven. Well, that's true. But you need to allow that person to grieve, to experience their sorrow so they can heal. Sometimes we try to help people and our hearts are good, our words aren't. And sometimes the best thing you can do is just sit there quietly and let that person cry and let that person complain. Oh, no, you shouldn't complain. God is good. I already know that. 
All things work together for the good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. This is all going to work out, really. And when is the last time you suffered like this? When did you lose your son? Well, I haven't, but I know what I know. You don't know what you would do. No, you don't. You don't know what you would do. And that's why I wouldn't give you advice. That's why I'll cry with you. Because that's what you need. And that's why I'll listen to you. Because that's what you need. We know our God is good and we know our God is able. We know our God will bring us through. But guess what? Sometimes it hurts. And when Jesus was in that grave for three days, his friends and family lost it. They grieved. They were losing. Even though he said, I will rise on the third day. Human beings need to grieve sometimes. And sometimes the worst thing that we can do is try and give them a quick fix when in fact they need to just cry. It's not wrong to cry. It's healthy to. To cry and say, God, my heart is broken is real. But my God heals the broken hearted. And that's why I cast my care on him because he cares for me. And that's why I worship the wounded healer for he was hurt and understands pain. That's why. He knows what's in man. And he knows what hurts in you. And so, Job's friends are doing the best ministry they could possibly do when they sat there quietly, but that only lasted a week. And then they opened their big mouths. And we're going to see that when we get back together and continue our study.